Hello, God bless you. My name is Stephen. I'm the pastor of Graffiti Fellowship in Brooklyn, New York, and it's time for today's daily devotion. This is where we take a chapter from the Bible and read it together. Uh, each day we post these videos five days a week. You can access them at any time. And uh, as we go, we're creating playlists um, by book. So we started with the Gospel of Matthew. There's a playlist, all 28 chapters. And we did the Gospel of Mark. There's a playlist has all 16 chapters. Now we're going through the uh, Gospel of Luke. And today is Luke chapter 11. Chapter 11 is 53 verses, kind of the higher side of average length, just a little longer than average. Jesus is going to teach about prayer in this chapter. Um, we see a commentary on... Uh, Jesus and the Prince of Demons. The sign of Jonah is one of the subsections. Receiving the light, Jesus criticizes the religious leaders as he is uh, wont to do. And those are the different sections in this chapter. Let's read Luke chapter 11, verse 1 begins. Once Jesus was in a certain place praying, and as he finished, one of his disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. Jesus said, this is how you should pray. Father, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. Give us each day the food we need and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation. Then... Teaching them more about prayer, he used this story. Suppose you went to a friend's house at midnight saying, uh, you want to borrow three loaves of bread. You say to him, a friend of mine has just arrived for a visit and I have nothing for him to eat. And suppose he calls out from his bedroom, don't bother me. The door is locked for the night and my family and I are all in bed. I can't help you. But I tell you this, though we won't do it for friendship's sake, if you keep knocking long enough, he will get up and give you whatever you need because of your shameless persistence. And so I tell you, keep on asking and you'll receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you'll find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you for everyone who asks receives, everyone who seeks finds, and to everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. You fathers, if your children ask for a fish, do you give them a snake instead? Or if they ask for an egg, do you give them a scorpion? Of course not. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? One day Jesus cast out a demon from a man who couldn't speak, and when the demon was gone, the man began to speak. The crowds were amazed, but some of them said, uh, said, no wonder he can cast out demons. He gets his power from Satan, the prince of demons. Others, trying to test Jesus, demanded that he show them a miraculous sign from heaven to prove his authority. He knew their thoughts, and so he said, Any kingdom divided by civil war is doomed. A family splintered by feuding will fall apart. You say that I'm empowered by Satan, but if Satan is divided and fighting against himself, how can his kingdom survive? And if I'm empowered by Satan, what about your own exorcists? They cast out demons too, so they'll condemn me for what you've said. But if I'm casting out demons by the power of God, then the kingdom of God has arrived among you. For when a strong man like Satan is fully armed and guards his palace, his possessions are safe until someone even stronger attacks and overpowers him, strips him of his weapons, and carries off his belongings. Anyone who isn't with me opposes me, and anyone who isn't working with me is actually working against me. When an evil spirit leaves a person, it goes into the desert searching for rest. But when it finds none, it says, I'll return to the person I came from. So it returns and finds that its former home is all swept and in order. Then the spirit finds seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they all enter the person and live there. That person's worse off than before. As he was speaking, a woman in the crowd called out, God bless your mother, the womb from which you came and the breast that nursed you. And Jesus replied, but even more blessed are all who hear the word of God 
and put it into practice. Verse 29, as the crowd pressed in on Jesus, he said, this evil generation keeps asking me to show them a miraculous sign, but the only sign that I will give them is the sign of Jonah. What happened to him was a sign to the people of Nineveh that God had sent him, and what happens to the Son of Man will be a sign to these people that he was sent by God. The Queen of Sheba will stand up against this generation on Judgment Day and condemn it, for she came from a distant land to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Now someone greater than Solomon is here, but you refuse to listen. The people of Nineveh will also stand up against this generation on Judgment Day and condemn it, for they repented of their sins at the preaching of Jonah. Now someone greater than Jonah is here, but you refuse to repent. No one lights a lamp and then hides it or puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where its light can be seen by all who enter the house. Your eye is a lamp that provides light for your body, and when your eye is good, your whole body is filled with light. When it's bad, your body is filled with darkness. Make sure that the light you think you have is not actually darkness. If you're filled with light, with no dark corners, then your whole life will be radiant as though a floodlight were filling you with light. As Jesus was speaking, one of the Pharisees invited him home for a meal, and so he went in and took his place at the table. His host was amazed to see that he sat down to eat without first performing the hand-washing ceremony required by Jewish custom. And the Lord said to him, You Pharisees are so careful to clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are filthy, full of greed and wickedness. Fools, didn't God make the inside as well as the outside? So clean the inside by giving gifts to the poor, and you'll be clean all over. What sorrow awaits you, Pharisees, for you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens, but you ignore justice and the love of God. You should tithe, yes, but do not neglect the more important things. What sorrow awaits you, Pharisees, for you love to sit in the seats of honor in the synagogues and receive respectful greetings as you walk in the marketplaces. Yes, what sorrow awaits you, for you are like hidden graves in a field. People walk over them without knowing the corruption they are stepping on. Teacher, said an expert in religious law, you've insulted us too with what you just said. Yes, Jesus said. What sorrow also awaits you, uh, experts in religious law, for you crush people with unbearable religious demands and you never lift a finger to ease the burden. What sorrow awaits you, for you build monuments for the prophets your own ancestors killed long ago. But in fact, you stand as witnesses who agree with what your ancestors did. They killed the prophets and you joined them in their crime by building the monuments. This is what God in His wisdom said about you. I'll send prophets and apostles to them, but they will kill some and persecute others. As a result, this generation will be held responsible for the murder of all God's prophets from the creation of the world. From the murder of Abel to the murder of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the sanctuary, yes, it will certainly be charged against this generation. What sorrow awaits you, experts in religious law, for you remove the key to knowledge from the people. You don't enter the kingdom yourselves, and you prevent others from entering. As Jesus was leaving, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees became hostile and tried to provoke him with many questions. They wanted to trap him into saying something they could use against him. That's the end of Luke chapter 11. Uh, a lot of great content here. Uh, this chapter begins with what's commonly called the Lord's Prayer. Um, Sometimes in circles, particularly in the Catholic Church, it's called the Our Father. Um, it's a model prayer. And um, from, from, from my perspective and that of our church and, 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 and many other churches, churches uh, sometimes have different views on this prayer. Um, but as I read it here in, in, in verse 2, it says, This is how you should pray. And Jesus gives us a model. These are the priorities. This is the heartbeat behind prayer. These are the, this is the, um, this is the, the kind of desires that we should have in prayer. Uh, it doesn't say this is what you should pray. So um, I think that there's a lot of beauty, and I think that there's a lot of benefit in the sort of high church liturgical rites, you know, the repeating of certain things ceremonially and 
And, and I think that's really uh, beautiful. And the, the Lord's Prayer is used that way. And, and, I, and I think that's a good thing. But it's not the only way we should pray. And I think Jesus' encouragement here is not always pray this only every time you pray. But pray with this heartbeat. Pray with this inclination and these desires. Um, and it's just all pointed at His kingdom. Thanks so much for partic participating in Luke chapter 11. Hope you've been blessed by it. Uh, I know I have, and uh, looking forward to seeing you again next time when we read Luke chapter 12. God bless you.